Welcome. I'm your host, Elaine Miller Karras. You can also watch us on Facebook Live on Resiliency Within. And this month, we celebrate Black History Month. Its theme for 2022 is Black health and wellness, focused on the legacy of Black scholars and medical practitioners in Western medicine. The 2022 theme considers activities, rituals, and initiatives that Black communities have done to be well. I have four guests today that I think will illuminate um, the uh, goal of the 2022 objectives. So our, our show today is called Steps in Courage, Racial Equity, Healing, and Civic Engagement. So a team of multi-generational civic, civil leader, rights leaders, historians, educators, community leaders, and clinicians gathered together to participate in a landmark initiative um, regarding racial equity. Rena Evers Everett assembled a team of progressive thinkers dedicated to empowering future generations with historic civil rights truth through a trauma-informed lens. In the process, new partnerships were formed and new meanings about race, equity, and healing were articulated. Um, Rena is with us today, as well as Kenneth Mason, Kevin McLeod, and Jordan Murphy, who will share their thoughts and insights into what it means to take steps in courage and confront the truth about race and trauma through a lens of healing and resilience. Rena Evers Everett is a daughter of civil rights activist Medgar Evers and Marilee Evers Williams. Since 2012, Rena has been the executive director of the Medgar and Marilee Evers Institute, a national organization founded by her mother to fulfill her father's vision of activism through education and civic engagement programs. Jordan Murphy, um, PhD is a nurse and researcher specializing in pediatric behavioral health with a particular interest in social and emotional development, epigenetics, and the effects of intergenerational trauma. Kevin McLeod is a director of development at the Trauma Resource Institute. Mr. McLeod leads the Equity, Diversion, uh, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, centering around developing, supporting, implementing, and evaluating EDI strategies, co content development, and programs within TRI. And Mr. Kenneth Mason was appointed to the Georgia State Board of Education in 2011 and represents Metro Atlanta in the 5th Congressional District. He's an instructional coach at the Southern Regional Education Board, where he promotes college and career readiness. Mr. Mason was also selected as a fellow Bailey Sullivan Leadership Institute Fellowship organized by Black Alliance for Educational Options. I am welcome, the four of you. This is the first time I've had a panel of four people, and I am so excited that the four of you um, are here with us. And I am going to start with Rena Evers Everett, my dear friend. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about, I'm just going to call it MMEI, because that's a mouthful <laughs> to see that Medgar Evers, Medgar and Marilee Evers Institute. Um, so Rena, welcome, and please let us know what you've been up to. Well, good afternoon, Elaine, and all of my friends on this wonderful panel, and all of you out uh, listening and, and seeing us. Uh, it is truly a pleasure being here, and, and it's always a joy being with this group. So if you ever ask us to be together, just make sure you understand it's, it's for a purpose, but also with a good time. Um, I, as Elaine has explained, I'm... Um, and I always say this because I am so very proud to be the daughter of Medgar and Merle Evers and um, just being around them as, as we were growing up in Mississippi uh, just brought a whole new lens of reality um, to our family, but especially to me, uh, seeing my father uh, really being diligent and um, so persistent with e equality and social, and social justice throughout Mississippi, but actually throughout the nation. And so um, my mom, as Miss Elaine has said, uh, after my father's assassination in 1963, uh, took us to California. And actually I met Elaine in California. Uh, but she also uh, is a woman who's, who's fiercely courageous, who's progressive and, and just committed to not only making sure that justice was done for our family, 
because after 30 plus years, um, we actually were able to say that we got the killer of my father and he was uh, life in prison and, and died there. Um, but she was just persistent in her own careers. Um, and so she said, I'm doing this for Medgar. I'm doing this for my love mm. and my family and the nation. And uh, she started the Medgar Evers Institute in honor of my father. Uh, when I came into the Institute, that was in the late, late, late 90s. When I came into the Institute, I said, there's no way that it could just be for dad. You have done so much. And so we renamed it to the Medgar Murley Evers Institute. And our focus with the Institute is really about civic, social, positive change. And uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, and- so Rena, I'm just gonna, I wanna ask you a question because I think this is important. Yes. You, you brought us all together for this for the Kellogg um, Racial Equity 2030 initiative we worked together for many months Mm -hmm. it was it was it was really a privilege I think I could probably say that for all of us to work with you but can you give us a little bit of idea why like a steps and courage project why this is so important in terms of not only your own beliefs and passion but in the terms of the legacy of your father and your mom well I tell you uh just the term steps and courage Uh, is important because we all face that. And uh, it is understanding what history is. And so if you don't understand history, there's things that that are going to be repeated. And we see that now over and over again, that should not be repeated. And so it was really a a brainchild of both Jerry Mitchell, who's a civil rights, uh, well, he's an investigative reporter, and I and Kenneth um, to really start this where we could get the truth of history, primarily civil rights history in the mainstream, in education, in starting at, at kindergarten on up. So we could really know all as many players as we can get in the movement. Well, and Kenneth planted a little seed. He said, we should have Rena talk about the Mount Bayou project. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, cause we, we only have you, I know you have an important meeting that you have to attend a little bit later. You can't yeah. be with us for the whole hour. So can you maybe give us a little bit of light about that? <laughs> And Kenneth, you well, might want to say something as I well. I was about to say, I yes. might throw it over to Kenneth. <laughs> you, can, you can throw <laughs> that to me, but you can talk about after Mount Bayou, where we are now. I think that would be good. Like where we're going because of, because of the place of your birth. <laughs> and he just segues right into that one. He sure did. Mount he just Bayou it is, is a special place Uh, Not only for me, but for my father, uh, because after graduation from Alcorn, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, who was a famous civil rights um, leader of his own, uh, asked my father to come up and work under him with the Regional uh, Council of Negro Leaders. And that was a huge organization, very similar to NAACP that always, that gathered thousands and thousands among people in Mount Bayou. Mount Bayou uh, at that time was thriving. It was a thriving black community uh, that was started by uh, several, but uh, Isaiah T. Montgomery. Uh, And um, it was just the epitome of highlight for African-Americans in education and property ownership. And so, With that, the thing that is so important is that my father went out to educate the farmers because Mississippi, agriculture. And so to to get them involved and get them involved in understanding what their rights are. And so bringing up the courage, 
the steps of courage made not only by my father, by Dr. T.R.M. Howard, by Amzie Moore, by Aaron Henry, so many Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi to bring it to everybody. And so what we did in Mount Bayou was to go to their Founders Day celebration. We wanted to capture as many stories as possible from the elders uh, to really highlight what Mount Bayou is all about because it's a lost history. Mm -hmm. And um, as you're seeing now currently, history makes a, a major impact always, but it's really making a major impact now. And so we just want to capture the true stories as much as we can and we want to move it forward to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation by putting it in a format that is virtual in virtual reality. So going to the next generation where they are right now, okay? And so we, we did that. We were happy about that. I'll let Ken talk to you more about that, but we captured stories not only by VR, uh, um, Am I right, Ken? VR, AR, XR, all of them. <laughs> but by journalists that were um, that are nationwide, and and they wrote stories. Well, and it seems to me, as you're talking, Rena, that there has never been a more important time for truthful yes. history, mm -hmm. um, with all the kind of you know false um, mm -hmm. history that's being perpetrated, and that if we can get this oral history now. It's, it's the time is of the essence. Well, you know, Elaine, we talked about the racial equity 2030 and how important that every single one of you impacted that initiative. We worked so, so hard on it, but so, so thorough that we're getting ready to put it out to the world and others by doing things that you're doing right now, but if we don't know, as you have um, gently nudged me, <laughs> if you don't know where you are in life, where the trauma hits you in life, it's going to affect you for the rest of your life. And so I am privileged to know you and know the rest of you because of what peace and, and closure that you brought to me with my traumatic experience. And I want to be able to give that to the community. Yeah. And so Rena, I, I know that you do have to leave um, and our, our rest of our panelists are gonna, going to talk a little bit more about Steps and Courage and the different things that we've been doing. But if someone wants to get a hold of you, can you give us the website for MMEI so that um, people might be able to go to the website and find out all the wonderful things that are happening, um, including I know that your your family home was, was named. Yes, yeah, so do you want to just say a, a, a bit of that about that, and then give us your website so I, I keep my promise <laughs> that I said that okay, you're going to be on for about fifteen minutes, and then I know it's going to be you have to leave. <laughs> well, I tell you, okay. Well, uh, first of all. Um, there's no way we could have done what we did with, with Steps and Courage, the initiative, uh, uh, without this group. And, you're here, you're and, here. Uh, there's just no way. And it is something that for all of you listening and looking, you, you, you have something to look forward to with this group because we're getting ready to hit this. <laughs> but they, they're gonna have to tell you about that. But the, um, the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute website is eversinstitute.org. Um, I'm going to just give a disclaimer, just, you know, we haven't finished working on the website. So just look at it, but things are coming within the next month where it's going to be exactly what it needs to be. And um, then one thing that is so, such an honor is the National Park Service um, 
uh, I, I'm, I'm getting emotional about I, it. I, I, named, can, I can see that. <laughs> named your family named residence. Our, our family home in Jackson, a national monument. And it is doing, um, right now it's closed to go inside, but the National Parks is working uh, along with the Medgar Murley Evers Institute regarding programming, regarding uh, information, educational information that's getting out. And we'll be hearing from some other things that are important very soon. Well, Rena, thank you so much for, I know, taking time out of your really busy schedule and joining us. I know how important this project has been to you. And I think, you know, the five of us are very dedicated to you and MMEI. So thank you so much. Well, my hearts go out to you always, all of you. And um, I can't wait for us to do this again and present new information. Well, and I know that we will. And so that's why I want our listeners to know that we all got together because you brought us together <laughs> and that, and that we're not done and it's going to continue and we're not done. And it's going to continue. That's the good news. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so okay, much. Okay. Thank you, Rena. Uh, love you. Okay. Love you Stay strong right. for, for everything we do. All right. Listeners. Now we're going to hear from our panel and I am going to start with, um, Dr. Jordan Murphy, you know, I love calling you Dr. Jordan Murphy because I knew her before she was a doctor and now she's, a, I can say that, right? So I'm just yeah. curious, what motivated you to participate in the Kellogg Racial Equity 2030 initiative with all of us? Um, well, I have to say when the opportunity was first presented, um, there was a little hesitancy there because I work in uh, healthcare. And so getting involved with something historic seemed uh, more of a stretch. But I have to say, after that first meeting, I felt so motivated. Um, just like uh, Ms. Serena mentioned, just knowing our history, knowing where we came from. Um, and then also, how can we use that history to make progress? And adding in that trauma-informed piece or thinking about how um, trauma interacts with the educational system and how that is influenced by the curriculums that are presented or delivered. And so finding my way in how I might fit and just contribute to such a, a wonderful initiative. Thank you, Jordan. So I'm gonna to go to Kenneth now, cause I know he's been involved for a long time, but let's have you give us, I'm gonna ask you the same question. So what motivated you to participate? Uh, the, the excitement around collaborating with a, a group of, of um, soon to be friends and family <clears throat> dedicated to, to uh, in my mind, in my perspective, do what it takes to um, help children not only learn for their, from their past, not just uh, address the trauma they've been through, but encourage them in, um, to be resilient. So when all of, when we started discussing the possibilities as a team, I, I got really rooted in the idea that I, I was gonna get to learn um, a whole new skill set in the time of my life, in the time of all of our lives nice. where we needed it, all of our lives. We, we needed to be able to discuss healing. We needed to be able to uh, discuss racial inequities. We need to be able to discuss our own feelings on that given, uh, in a given day. And we did all those things through the process. So I'm very thankful for those weeks and months of discussing with you all. And I know that as a result of that, I think you spent a lot of time with um, Mr. Kevin McLeod. Um, so I'm going to have him go next. So what motivated you to participate I, with um, the project, Kevin? Uh, just the, the incredible opportunity that, that presented itself just by you know, being part of the Trauma Resource Institute, your relationship with um, <clears throat> Rena Evers Everett and you know, her story, but also just the, uh, the reward you know, the opportunity to, to harness the power of the narrative to inspire others. And despite some of the difficulties that exist and have existed, still focusing on those elements that offer promise and hope. You know, that, that really want, um, made me want to get involved with the project even more. 
I think it was hopeful. It was hard work and it was hopeful, very hopeful. So that brings me to my next question, which is what role did each of you contribute to the project? Which one of you would like to go first on that one? Kenneth, do you want to go first on that one? I'll do go with, I'll go first to you. Yeah, I, I, I my role was, uh, it still is special assistant to Rena. I, I, I got, this is a, a long time coming in her mind and I've gotten to work with her in a, in a lot of different roles and know her and to see how this leadership has budded um, uh, around in particular this year uh, of addressing the 2030 grant because of everything um, that we had personally been through. So my role was to conceptualize that vision and then be able to communicate it as well as I could to the other partners. And sometimes it was it was difficult because we needed each of you to help define it, but I could always see what it what it could become. So I think that was my role. Puzzle puzzle piece shifting. You seem to have the overarching knowledge of what needed to happen, right? Because sometimes yeah. it was hard. So I'm going to go to Jordan next. So what was your part? Um, what, what did you contribute, Jordan? So my role was to support in the area of research and evaluation. So really helping us to measure change. You know, if we create this trauma-informed curriculum, um, if we use a trauma and resiliency informed approach like the community resiliency model, well, how do we measure it? How do we know that it works? How do we know that the youth like the model and like the approach? How do we know that the educators like delivering the model? So asking those questions that can help us measure change over time, and then hopefully um, pulling those results together to get something solid, get some objective and subjective data to present to partners in the world and say, you know, this is what it means to have a, a trauma-informed curriculum and to incorporate historic truth. Okay, and then finally, and Kevin, how about for you? What, what did you contribute? Oh, just various aspects of the project, some uh, back office, so some of the financial and, and budgeting items. Uh, in addition to that, got to be a thought partner to a lot of our pro um, partners, uh, Kenneth and I, for example, just really evaluating and analyzing, you know, what is this theory of change going to be so that, you know, we actually hand something to Jordan that, that can actually effectively be measured. Uh, and we, we, we proved that, you know, our theory of change can actually come about. Uh, in addition to that, just some of the curriculum and instruction uh, elements, uh, you know, how does this look practically, you know, in a classroom or uh, other educational environment? You know, what is it that we would actually do programmatically to bring some of this stuff about? So those were some of the, the, the different places that, that I was able to weigh in. Well, and I hadn't thought about this, but I actually have been a contributor too. <laughs> That's what I was. I, and, and Kenneth, I'm kind of smiling because I thought I always kind of felt like I was her special assistant too. <laughs> exactly. Us, right. Exactly. She has that, that way of nurturing us in that way going, well, can I, can you help me with this? I go, oh, of course I can help you with that. Right. So, um, but I do think it was probably bringing in the, um, some of more of the concepts of the community resiliency model that we thought if, if children are going to be learning about really the, some of the terrible trauma that happened in, in the history that we needed something to also help them to be able to navigate that within their nervous system and to perhaps be able to um, come back into their, what we call the zone of well being as they were learning. Because if they were too knocked out of their zone, maybe they couldn't take in the important elements that we really wanted to convey to them about the history, the truthful history. So um, I, I felt very honored to be a part of this. So, that explanation uh, yes. makes so much sense. Does it? it? It makes so much sense. Uh, and that's one of the things I took away from that. Listening to the way you described how and why um, you wanted to be involved with this project, the ner addressing the needs of the nervous system is going to help learning. It's going to create the environment we need. So thank you for reminding us. Well, and I think that's so important for all of us, you know, when we're talking about um, subjects that are dear to our heart that also carry so much trauma along with it is that how do we how do we do that deep listen and not lose ourselves in the process of it? 
So um, I'm going to ask an, another question now. Oh my goodness, we're almost halfway through. I'm going to definitely have to have part two of this. This is always what happens. I knew this was going to happen with the, with all of us, right? But um, what it, does it mean to be a trauma informed educational curriculum? And I'm going to I'm going to go up to Kevin for this one because he's been in a lot of time with trauma informed resiliency focused information. With that, uh, I, I believe it's in the approach and just approaching people with consideration that there are life experiences that they have had or may still be having that are impacting them and you know, not looking at them from a deficit point of view, oh, what's wrong with you because of this, but, you know, looking at it in a way that is, you know, both trauma informed, but then also resiliency focused. So having a curriculum like the one that we're trying to create creates entry, we, we need it to create entry points for well being with that. So all those things in mind. So whatever goals, objectives, strategies we had, we needed to have those entry points that would foster well-being along with some of that learning that was taking place because this was hard work these are hard concepts and hard content to to deal with you know day in and day out but we can create that environment that promotes you know well-being and promote a a safer environment for learning you know given the incorporation of the community resiliency model wellness skills and having that in mind you know, that, that, that would help us to be more successful in the end. Well, and I just have to, I guess I have to reveal that you are a community resiliency model teacher. So is Jordan. And I think Kenneth will be at some point in the future. We still have to get you in there. Kenneth. You I know am that. so ready. <laughs> I know so you ready. are. I, I, and also I know that you've read my book because you told me that <laughs> when I first yes. mentioned, I'm going, Oh my goodness. All right. That I'm writing the second revision of that, that thing right now. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit stressed about it. I suppose I'm, I'm using the skills to help me get through it. But when we get back from our break, we're going to take a, a short break right now. I'm going to actually ask Kevin something that is not one of our prepared questions. Kevin, you sent me the most, because I know you talk to your daughters about well-being. They are both children in the educational system, but your daughter gave you the sweetest, sweetest Valentine's card. And I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit about what she wrote about, because I think what she did is what we're talking about. So would you be willing Definitely. to do that, Kevin? Yes, okay, of course. Great. All right. And you all, and Kenneth and, and Jordan, you, you are in for a treat to hear what his, little, was it, what his little girl wrote in his Valentine's Day card. So we will be back in just a few, a couple minutes. And um, remember that we're being sponsored by the Trauma Resource Institute. And we will be back with Jordan Murphy and Kenneth Mason and Kevin McLeod in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back. I'm here with Kevin McLeod, Kenneth Mason, and Jordan Murphy. We are talking about steps in courage, racial equity, healing, and civic engagement. And right before the break, um, Kevin was talking about what it meant to be trauma-informed. And I remembered that he shared with me a very sweet um, card that his daughter had sent him. So Kevin, would you explain what you've shared with your daughter educationally and how she would send you such a lovely car. Well, I know that you're a lovely dad, but that's one of the reasons, but can you share with us what that was? Uh, as Elaine alluded to earlier, uh, I am a community resiliency model teacher. So I'm always talking about the wellness skills of the community resiliency model and how I use these skills to show up as the best version of myself from the best parts of myself. And it seems to have had an impact on, uh, you know, my daughters. Uh, my youngest one in particular, Aubrey, she, she gave me a Valentine's Day card, and I'm going to read it to you uh, in a moment, but it, it shows a lot about how she thinks about uh, herself and then how she thinks about the world. So we've got lots of love here and even some civic engagement. So it says, hi, I think you are the best dad ever created. I would love, love, love you. Dad, I want you to be happy. Dad, I want me to be happy. I want the whole world to be happy everyone to be happy help me to make the whole wide world happy forever and ever p.s my list safety cap resilient zone love and kindness and just make the world better oh kevin that is i don't i have i have sweet tears in my eyes i don't know about kenneth and jordan oh my gosh jordan's just doing a thumbs up thank you so much wow yes wow. that's wow. that's yeah, that that's making me float for you, Kevin. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's all, Aubrey. Um, I was just excited that you know, a she's thinking about 
you know, love and, you know, loving the world, uh, but also thinking about the resilient zone and, and things like that. And just, you know, that's an example of how we can take what we are creating, though, with this work that we started with um, the, the Kellogg 2030 <clears throat> around racial equity, and we can get it out to students. You know, we have uh, information that is easily digestible for them. And we are talking about, you know, the wellness skills of the community resiliency model where, you know, I, I did this as an adult, but you can get it across to a second grader in a way that's meaningful and understandable. And so connecting that with real events, you know, historical events that have taken place and allowing people to pull out the tidbits of resilience that exist there and then capitalizing on that and building on that narrative so that they can go forward and take those steps themselves. I think we're on to something. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and, and I mean, I just hope Aubrey can even hear this today that we talked about her on the program because that's just lovely. And I, I want to get back to Jordan um, because I know, Jordan, you might have some perspectives mm -hmm. as well as well as about what it means to have a trauma-informed educational curriculum? Yeah. Um, well, first, let me just say to Kevin, I think that statement was so impactful um, because it sounds like there's resiliency filled inside your home. And we were working on getting this curriculum out to the public and schools, but imagine if our youth had that experience at home and also in the schools. And so when it comes to creating this trauma-informed curriculum, that's a thought that's always in my mind. Um, how can we bring what's in the schools into the home and can there be some continuity there? And so, you know, of course, there are ways of defining um, trauma based on individuals' perspectives and um, social and, and cultural factors. And then also being really sensitive to the what if. Um, you know, what if I'm learning about race and racism and my heart starts to pound and my palms get sweaty and I'm surrounded by individuals in the classroom and I don't know yet how to express what I'm uh, physically experiencing. Is there a um, intervention or a wellness model that I can use? In fact, there is, it's called the community resiliency model um, which was a part of this curriculum. And so that's something that I try to keep in mind. You know, how do we respond to those what if questions not just for the youth, but also for the educators. Um, it can be very difficult to deliver content that addresses, um, you know, challenging topics. And can we provide a space for our educators to experience wellness as they're delivering this content? Well, and Jordan, it just also just came to me that you're going to be doing an initiative in Georgia that is kind of like that, isn't it? You're going to, could you just mention that briefly? Because that is so exciting because I think that we have all these parts but we also have something that's overarching that Kenneth is going to talk about in a little bit. But can you share that wonderful project? Yes, I can. I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited by it. I'm, I'm working with the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And we're also partnering with Resilient Georgia. And we are um, doing monthly CRIM introductions and workshops for child serving organizations across the state. And so that includes um, family and child services and uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice and um, even a mayor group and insurance groups, um, any group that is serving children. So I'm, I'm thrilled, of course. I think this is just one part of the equation, um, getting CRIM out within the pediatric behavioral health arena. And then we're also working with educators because so much of um, mental and behavioral health has to be addressed within the school systems. Yeah. I mean, just so our listeners know, CRIM is the community resiliency model. We just kind of make it short because it's very long to say that every time. But this actually, what you're saying actually segues to the next question that I want to ask Kenneth. And Kenneth, if there's anything more you want to say about trauma-informed, but it, what does it, how do you navigate discussions about race and trauma from a healing perspective? Well, I, I, I think we, we have to start with empathy and compassion and patience. Um, we all came together during a time where we were unsure if children were going to be able to go back in school. That was my every day of trying to figure out how to provide something real to teachers and parents virtually under, um, you know, while also trying to be safe. So, 
um, it, it taught us that we have to be reactive and um, to and responsive to the needs that students have um, while studying, of course, this topic, um, but any topic. Uh, when when they when children are in school and they have these things in their lives, um, educators need to be informed with how to bring one back into their zone. And, and, uh, and I just have to say this, Aubrey created the, a, a great template for a element of this curriculum. What is the text that the student created? A card, a greeting card. And, but use the correct terminology. She spoke about herself, her family, meaning beyond the assignment. And then we can, we can tie that writing to Phyllis Wheatley. Um, you know, a, a little girl that was a genius that but because of the time in which she lived in and the trauma in which her parents faced and which she faced, her poetry wouldn't be known for, you know, years. And we can inspire students to be resilient by creating their own story. And Kevin, you have a story and this continues. We go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in on that as well, just about navigating these discussions about race and trauma. Uh, I think Jordan framed it very well in that the, the what if question. So we have to normalize uh, what may happen in our nervous system as we continue doing this work. As we talk about some of those things, as as Kenneth mentioned, you know, Phyllis Wheatley not necessarily having the opportunities that she would have, that may land for someone, you know, in their nervous system in a way that's that's dysregulating. So, what can we do? And then also normalizing in a in a sense of that makes sense that your nervous system is responding that way. That makes sense that you know you're hesitant to enter into this conversation about race you know, about any other uh, identity type of issue, that makes sense. But hey, here's some things that you can do to make that a little bit easier. You know, you know, this is what we do. Uh, these are some things we do in order to, to get in our resilience zone so that we can push through and have those conversations because these are hard conversations. This is difficult topics and subject matters that we are approaching, but yet and still we're committed to doing so because of what we could reap on the other side. And we contribute our behaviors and reactions to that, to what it is, and not something else. It is stressful it, in all of us. It is going to cause a reaction. Our awareness and an educator's awareness and the adults around, um, I mean, the community approach of awareness to this is going to help us be able to, to um, attribute um, our behavior, our reaction to what um, it should be attributed to. Well, and I think as you're as you're both are talking, I was thinking about the different places I've been on in the world and and all the different things that happen between peoples. And if we don't recognize that there is that kind of reaction within ourselves, that really does can send us up into what we call the high zone or the low zone of just being disconnected, then I think it really does take away the opportunity of not only having self-compassion, but like Aubrey had compassion for someone else, what she wanted for the world, right? It really broadens our perspective, our lens, that we're not alone in this, that this is, is not just me and dad, this is me and dad and our community and our world. And I think that's what excites me about the steps in courage, because by saying what the truth is, it does widen the perspective of giving, okay, yes, this is happening now, this is happening then, but also what else is happening? Like all of us getting together and creating ideas for steps and courage that may change the way that children all over the world, not just America, experience the truth in the history, which kind of gets me to a question that I, I wanna make sure we have time for. And that is how does technology play a role in education and learning in the context of steps and courage? We are living in a technological world right now. And do any of you want to jump into that one? I think that was um, your question, Kenneth. Well, you yeah. To say and a little bit about that. Rena started uh, started it a, a bit where we can um, use virtual. We have a partner um, um, in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, virtual reality company. They are an XR company. They do um, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, which 
um, that is what young people, I mean, it's, 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 it's hot in their world. And so uh, Rena discovered this and also found that the device itself can be used um, as a great empathy machine. That's what we kind of started it because um, when you, when your mind experiences visiting Rena's home in Jackson, Mississippi, when she was a little girl, and um, we, we engage you in a discussion about her life or any story, any of these steps of courage, um, it's different from reading it in the textbook. You are walking in the textbook and experiencing um, that life and your brain and your body respond to it. And therein we have the connection with when your brain and your body respond to that, we take off the headset and now we help people move forward from that experience, not only to be resilient, but to be creative. Um, to be um, to to be bold to um, to have a discussion or just to be quiet, and so these this is Rena's vision for how uh, she would like to carry the story forward using this technology um, in a variety of ways to allow a multi generational group express themselves. And I think when we talk about the technology, I mean, it's very important. I want people to know as well that we all came together because of the Kellogg grant, but we didn't get it. And the reason there were reasons we didn't get it that didn't have anything to do with the fact that we had created a really wonderful program. There were other factors in play. So we're still looking for funding sources. So if anybody's out there thinking, oh, this is a great idea. How can I contribute to this? I want you all to know that you can contact Rena directly through the website. And you could also contact the Trauma Resource Institute and we will put you together with those folks. But Kenneth, I can see you have something to say about that. Because No, we, we just didn't stop because the concept is too valuable uh, to us, but, but the, the folks that we can impact uh, with it. And so, uh, although we, we I, don't, I don't feel like we ever stopped. The, we didn't the, stop, we didn't stop. And so, <laughs> and so, and so, yes, it was, a, so I, I thank you for reaching out to your audience. And yeah, we are, we are looking for um, uh, other partners to help drive this work. Because we think it's absolutely possible and we're all committed. And I think you can see the commitment of the, of the people that are on the show today. And there, there's more than the, that's the five of us. There's, there's a, a, a larger group than this, but I think this gives you an idea of kind of the directions that we wanna go. So uh, let me ask the next question and maybe uh, whoever wants to go first on this one. And that is how can young people become reflective curators of history and healing? What an important question. So who would like to go first on that one? I think that was yours again, Kenneth, but I would really love both of you, no. Jordan and, and Kevin, to jump in on the answer to that one. I can go where that question came from. Uh, one of our partners, Lance, who is our bridge to the millennial uh, generation, uh, always reminds us, uh, he works in the museum space, always reminds us that we have to help young people curate artifacts, curate texts, curate um, stories, moments, their own moments. And so, um, you know, our work is going to lead towards um, young people uh, being aware of doing land acknowledgements, understanding where you are physically in the world, but also using the technology. We can pinpoint satellite GPS where you are, be aware of that as well, but also be aware of the history of that land and um, the freedom fighters that allowed us to be on this land together. So acknowledging the earth itself, but the people that allow us to, to be here together. And so, and, and, and acknowledging that they can curate their own stories and, and really starting and ending with that, um, letting them know you're part of this land, you're part of this history, and let's make it together in, in a positive way. Well, that pretty, that really says it really well. So Kevin or Jordan, Jordan, go right ahead. Jordan has something to add. Well, I'll just add, I think it also starts too with empowering them, letting them know that they can become reflective curators. Um, there's no age limit. 
and really giving them the tools and the structure and seeing where they go with it, seeing how they become creative, seeing how they come up with new ideas that we never have, have thought about. Um, and then just really valuing their work and their contribution and inspiring them to continue to pass it along to those who are coming after them. And Kevin, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. I think All my right. colleagues said it very well. <laughs> I think they have said it really well. So let's talk, and oh my goodness, the, the time is slipping away. So um, what future planning is underway and how are we building capacity and growing leaders? I think that's a great segue from Jordan's comment. So who would like to go first on that one? Well, this was Rena's question. So the, one of the reasons why she had to get off is a growing relationship with the Secretary of the Interior and the National Park Service and um, envisioning what the home site in Jackson, Mississippi can be with all of the programming, including steps in courage. And so um, uh, that, that is absolutely on the horizon. Uh, we, last year, we um, uh, were able to execute uh, the program, and um, we've said earlier in Mount Bayou in Rena's home, um, the oldest um, settlement of um, Black people, um, maybe in the country, um, and to celebrate Founders Day. But can you imagine us celebrating Founders Day in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, with VR headsets? We brought the headsets down and it was our elders. We thought it would be popular with the students, the young people. It was our elders that sat in the room. Mm. The program was supposed to be an hour. We were there until six, we closed the building up. They stayed with us. Elaine, one, um, huh. one um, gentleman a little older than me, could have been my father, um, he I took the, the headset off. He and I said, I'm here just to talk to you about whatever you're feeling right now. And in the room, Rena's there. Megar Evers uh, uh, typewriter is behind um, him. There's interviews going on. We're collecting oral history interviews. And he was so moved. He just left and went to his car. He came back like a half hour later and he said, I just wanted to hug you, but because of this, I couldn't because of, you know, and he was so, he was, you know, the, we didn't have to have much of a conversation, but the fact that I gave, you know, we gave permission to feel something and we're here. So that was our proof of concept. And we're going to, hey, we've, we're part of the planning committee of, Founders Day now. Well, all I can say um, is that also it hit it, it also it's like he was his history was seen. He was heard in what you provided for him. Absolutely. And there is something so deep, I think, within the human nature that when we are really listened to and we are heard with the truth, it changes us. Mm -hmm. We're acknowledged. Well, that's just a beautiful story. So you're now part of Founders Day. Yes. We're part of Founders Day. We are part of Founders Day. We are part of, well, you know, obviously we, I have to go out there sometime. And now Maybe we, I can travel in person. And <laughs> that's what we're hoping. We can get towards a, a place where um, those of you are, that are trained in CRIM, we're organizing this approach and applying the curriculum in a more full way and uh, giving people a rounded experience and, 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 and measuring that healing right there. We can, we can talk to them about their experience before and after. So I'm ready. Okay, I can, I can tell. So that's gonna be your final word because we got about three minutes left. So I'm gonna ask Jordan, do you have anything you'd like to say as your, as your parting words today? Any words of wisdom to our listeners? Yeah, well, I'll just kind of um, revisit one thing we mentioned earlier is that we are absolutely still meeting to put this initiative out there. Um, we've worked so hard on it and are so committed to, especially now, uh, making sure that young people and really anyone who is going for any education has access to um, education and also has the opportunity to learn it in a really novel way, which is within this framework of wellness and healing 
to even know that healing is possible. Um, and so the work continues. Um, we're very excited about it. And um, I think about it more often now, especially um, with just the current events and my own work as a crim teacher and working with educators. Thank you, Jordan. And how about you, Kevin? Well, quickly, I'll just say a couple of things that have resonated with me throughout this conversation. And, you know, some people may say, well, why well-being? Why do you want to incorporate these skills of well-being? First off, well-being for engagement. You know, the more well people are, the more they are likely to engage in these conversations that have proven to be difficult over time. In addition to that, you know, well-being for reflection. We want people to reflect. We want people to challenge themselves and learn more about themselves and others as we, you know, attempt to, to you know, create this larger community. And, and then lastly, you know, just well-being so that, that this work continues, well-being for action, because the work is going to be hard. We need to continue going. So, you know, well-being for action to sustain us as we continue to move this work forward. All right. Well-being in action. And if you would like to get in contact with any of these folks, www.traumaresourceinstitute.com. And Kevin will connect you to Jordan and to Kenneth. And Kevin, you want to give your email address? Yes, you can reach me at K McLeod, that's K-M-C-L-E-O-D at communitytry.com. And I would like to just thank from the bottom of my heart, all of you for coming and sharing your wisdom. And I do think we are going to have other shows about this in the future when we can tell them what happens next year at Mount Value, because I certainly would like to know that. And thank you so much, listeners. And next week, my guest will be Bernita R. Walker, the CEO and co-founder of Project Peacemakers, Inc., who was recently selected for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's African-American Advisory Board and the District Attorney's Inaugural Governance Board for South Los Angeles. What a job. So she'll be with me next week. So again, thank you. And remember, all of you, the what we're hearing from our um, guest today is how they have taken also the suffering that you've all experienced and how you're creating opportunities for well-being. And I'm just going to ask you all to think what else might be true in your life today, that if you're having a struggle or a hard time, maybe think about what else might be true in your life. So until next time, this is Elaine Miller-Karras signing off for Resiliency Within.